So, a couple years ago, a question here said, what is the purpose of a fighter aircraft? And people up to that point had given answers like the job of fighter aircraft was to fly fast or to turn quickly or to shoot straight or do whatever. Uh, <coughs> Colonel Boyd came up with a different answer. He said the job of fighter aircraft is to do better than the other guy in a competitive situation. Okay, to survive in a competitive situation where the other guy doesn't. Having figured that out, he then uh, studied uh, dogfights and went from there to reanalyze the entire history of war from the beginning. Uh, the beginning of recorded history in light of how do you survive in a competitive environment, how do you do better than the other guy in a conflict situation. He worked out this briefing, which uh, is the most valuable classroom experience I personally have ever had. I can say that I learned more from eight hours of Colonel John Boyd about political science than I did in four and a half years at Washington and Lee. And uh, <coughs> two or three times for the time. <coughs> so it's a, a very, very valuable presentation. Mr. Colonel Boyd's presentation is in demand for two reasons. First of all, he's been pushing it on the American defense establishment to get them to ask themselves a question. Before they build an army or a weapon or whatever, uh, how are we going to succeed in a competitive environment? What is this thing going to do? And secondly, he's been in demand outside the defense community for people who find themselves in competitive environments who also want to figure out how to organize themselves to survive while the other guy does not. And it's in that context that we've invited Colonel Boyd to uh, uh, speak to us today, and this is Colonel John Boyd. Uh, one thing I like to, I want to point out that Bob pointed out, which is a very important point, is the fact that uh, this is not called pattern of war. Sometimes people don't even like that. You'll see a lot of military history here. And it's not called pattern of war. You'll see very often the press will be on 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 the press And I think we'll be understanding the way that we're going to study that. One other thing before I get into the presentation, I would like to make some comments. First of all, as I've already indicated, there's a large historical uh, aspect, a large, large historical content here. It's not that I wanted to look at uh, the military per se under a uh, restriction. What I would want to use it for is conflict in that environment is very sharp and you bring us very much new ones, bring us settlers. There's a large body of uh, information and experience here from throughout. A couple other comments I want to make. Now, if you notice, you already noticed my title. The other comment I want to make is that this isn't a recipe or a formula or the way to think about conflict. It is a way. I can't emphasize that enough. If you want to give your way to rich as possible, fill up a repertoire with a wide repertoire you can. Now, that'll become evident or manifest through the presentation. And the other point is, as I work my way through the presentation, you'll notice that. I might discuss some aspect or some phenomenon in a certain way, and then later on, I'll discuss very similar phenomena, but in a different way. In other words, you get a different image. Let me illustrate and show you what I'm getting at. Let's assume that we in this room went through all our life, and we only saw pyramids of the sun. There's no other experience with pyramids. Well, we go through life and saw pyramids of the sun. That would be an image or impression that we would have on the sun. Now, let's take another group, for example, and let's assume that they saw false air light or whatever on the top. And so they think it was a triangle, excuse me, a rectangle with intersecting guidance. Then let's say this group got to interact with the other group. You both think the other group was crazy. So you'd be thinking about triangle, they'd think about a square. You get your top mm -hmm. So we'll see why if they work on the presentation or whatever. Some phenomena from a different angle point, and you get quite a the key idea is you want to be able to see from the top, the side, a light angle, the inside, then you'll get a rich view of what a pyramid is. So using that as a rather oversimplistic example, in some ways you'll see the words you want to use to So you don't come up with what I call so-called elegant or definitive solutions. There are no elegant, there are no definitive circumstances other than other circumstances. And I think our university system, our intellectual community, in some way, has done a disservice to it by always talking about the so-called definitive solution. In fact, it really turns me off when I read a book and I see the definitive solution. 
because he found out a year later it didn't work. Well, it didn't work, then how could it have been so expensive? And so I think all you really want is something that's workable and can be used under the circumstances. One more comment before I go into the guide and presentation here. You'll also notice as we work our way through the presentation that I'll be taking holes and breaking them down to bits and pieces, as you normally you call them. And then I'll take bits and pieces and reconstruct holes. And so you'll see as we're working our way through the presentation, I'm pulling things apart, putting back together, pulling things apart, putting back together. In other words, an alternative a sequence of analyses and synthesis, whereby we're trying to get a richer and richer picture. We're not only trying to understand what's going on, but we're also trying to evolve a pattern or a framework or an image that might be different, different than what we are. So you see it will work for the With that enough said, let's get into the uh, <coughs> Okay, so we're going to start with the presentation. Now here's the outline of the presentation. Incidentally, before I get into it, I will be leaving a hard copy of that presentation I have here. Black and white hard copy. So a few people don't want to take voluminous notes or make public objections to all that. I will leave a hard copy. So it should be a But here's the outline of the presentation. Point of departure, and as Bob has already indicated to you, point of departure, we start out here to your comments. There are certain things that you saw there that was very deeply involved in the evolution design of the F 15 lightweight fighter. And when we went through that process, of course, at that time, we were the first time where we did it on high speed computers to get rid of really loud computers on. At that time, we had so called edge technology called IBM 794. They're relevant now because at that time, we can literally design all kinds of machines. Well, typically, what happens when you go through such a process, people tend to get what I call this arrogant, a little bit more confident because they take a look at things maybe from more vantage points. And so you tend not to worry too much about the test. But ultimately, you got to sit up to the real world. And typically, what happens is, you know, some things are right, some things don't work out. And so then, what the community likes to do is, then they say, well, those are just anomalies, of course, and you sweep it under the rug because that would all you got to schedule a program you don't want to, you don't want to interrupt this cash flow, you don't want to interrupt the program, you're trying to push now on. But it's been my experience when you do something like this, these anomalies have a habit of getting on the whole thing because they're very troublesome later on. In many ways, they can be, yeah. Many of you people seem to put it put stuff off and later on that you put it to wipe out the data from your hand. You begin to see these anomalies, you better pay attention, even if you don't understand. And that was one of the reasons people didn't understand it, they just wanted to have a little way to say nobody else understood. But eventually people do get understood. And then you have a very strict thing. So that's what happened. The result of that then why of course this stuff is threw me into what I call historical investigation. Now the most term I use here Historical snapshot. Why, no matter how much history you read, it's always bottom line. So you can only look at a certain snapshot you want to put it together. And we've already indicated the long course of my presentation. Once again, remember I'm going through a sequence of analysis and synthesis to try to understand what's happening to so the community or another impression to which we can see what I like to call a lens to a particular different lens to a core. As a result of that process, we can evolve or develop what I call categories of cognitive, not static or dynamic categories. And I'll show you in the next chart what those categories are. And okay, some of you have seen in a newspaper, you don't even realize what they're talking about. You've seen in certain places. And you'll see there's some very powerful images, relationships, and associates with those particular things. And that's what I will do. That will come later on in the presentation. Remember, we're going to work our way forward. We're going to the pictures so finally we see those categories. And then I go into what I call a super synthesis. In other words, I just grab all this stuff, try to get overall. Super ending for super synthesis. What's going on? So we get a real good lens for it. Now, that gives us a picture in the next chart. I'll tell you those key things that we're looking for to be in that synthesis. Now, as a result of that, in effect, we do have a new lens. So then I go back to two different in instances, look at an alternate history. So I've got a different kind of lens. Now, I want to look at certain events where certain phenomena took place. Guess what? If you look at the world with one kind of a lens, you get one kind of an image. If you look at the world with a different kind of lens, you get a different kind of image. And so you see, by looking at the same phenomenon, you draw up different interpretations or different idea of what occurred. Because remember, we're a prisoner of our own images, our own filters, our own views in our mind. We can see. We look through them. So we'll do that. Then what I do after we look at that, I wonder what I call a 
super condensation around the five chart. In other words, they just squeeze everything down. Say, what are those things you really been looking at? I'll show you that. Of course, at this point, you say, well, gee, why don't we throw Boyd out of here and just go to the wrap up simply and save this whole thing on every foundation? That's the normal way. But unfortunately, if we did that, I showed you the wrap up the first, it wouldn't have much meaning to it. But remember, the meaning was built up by going through this. When you're looking at it from a different frame of reference, you see those words, you say, you don't understand English. You say, what do you call it? So we've got to build up. In other words, that's the right of passing here to be there. You'll see that. Then you have to go through. You say, yeah, these are very significant. These are the kind of things you have to pay attention to. At least you're going to have this sort of impression through which you're going to view the world conversation. Now, you'll notice I have another term down here called epilogue. Well, as I went through the presentation, I became a little bit unsettled because unconsciously or consciously or in a sort of a subdued sense, I was juxtapositioning the ideas that I was tripling out. Versus the so-called critical report, or you know, those things are really grounded in stone. Right? You know, these things don't look like the same. So what I'm going to do in the epilogue, I'm going to take on the critical report. You'll notice as I work my way through, I'll have some rather sharp comments about the critical report, and you'll see why I think it was my work my way through, which caused me to really go back and look at it. Go ahead. You might tell us what you're going to talk to. Oh, yeah, we'll get it. I'll show you what the principles are. And what you're going to find out, the problem is there is no one set of principles. Different countries have different principles. So that right there should tell you something. And then some countries don't even have them. And they're not necessarily not successful. You want to keep that in mind. Yet we have this August plot in this country, you know, that the high priests just don't want to let the principles work out. Remember, you don't want to be a mastodon. There are no mastodons left on the earth. At least we don't think so. Of course, some of you people say, well, we still got to do some of our part. But nevertheless, <laughs> we have some old pentagons too. But I'm, I'm trying to point that out. You don't want to hold on things too tightly so you can't see the world through different angles. That doesn't mean you want to draw your traditions out either. Or the body experience. Now, the sources I won't brief off. You'll see in fact all the sources out here. So that in mind, let's start talking to our presentation. Now, this is what I call a focus and direction presentation to kind of give you a little bit of what we're doing. And the actual immediate mission we're trying to do is trying to accomplish. One, what we want to do is what I call make manifest and make evident. This aspect of conflict, moral, mental, and physical conflict. In other words, you can think of these three categories of moral, mental, and physical. We're going to talk about three categories. Now, many of you have heard Napoleon's famous statement the moral is the physical, the moral is the material, and three of one. Well, whether it was three to one or ten to one or not, that's not the point. He's trying to make. It's more important than the physical aspect. You draw a great deal, a great deal more leverage out of it by doing it. What we want to do, we see that nice statement. We want to put flesh around that. What are we really talking about? We're talking about we have moral strength, we have moral authority, we have moral value. How are we can use those concepts? So we get that moral leverage. We want to put flesh around. We're going to work our way through that. We work our way through yourself in the presentation. Now, as it turns out, since we start from air combat. We'll be primarily starting on the mental. The fighter files is one working against it, it's very much of a mental team. And then, as we start looking back in military history, we'll pick up the physical early military history. And then we'll start weaving them together. Start letting one interact with the other. And then, we'll the then, when we get back to the category of the conflict, we're going to go specifically look at those kinds of things and draw out the fighter thinker, the rather important feature. We really want to think. The next point, you know what I'm referring to here, or we call it both, but I don't know if you call it or not. Pattern for successful operation. What I'm referring to here is if we're going to be in a competitive or a conflict or adversarial relationship here, what are those kinds of things that we can do to gain leverage over our adversary? Or likewise, deprive him or deny him leverage against us. So, of course, that word leverage is nice. What do we mean by leverage? Well, that'll become evidence we go to the presentation. I don't know what we mean by leverage. But those things that give you that leverage against somebody, or those things you can do in order to minimize or diminish somebody's leverage against you, we want to understand. Now that's going to come out. In fact, these three things are going to show up in the in the symptom pattern of successful operation. We're going to go up so we can actually lay that down. Those kinds of things are important. Note the third bullet. 
the idea of trying to generalize tactics and strategies. Now, as we work our way through here, you're going to see different tactics, you're going to see different strategies. And you can lay out any number of tactics and strategies for a particular situation. So if you'd like to think you could subsume them under more general notions, it turns out you can. What are those general notions with which you can subsume those specific tactics, strategies, etc. under that? And you'll see that we can come up with something like this. And we can use it. But before we go into the presentation, I'd like to just make a couple comments. First of all, when we're speaking of tactics and strategy, you're when discussing it. What I and you can think about them in terms of what I call means and ends. You can think of tactics as a execution, activity, dynamics directed towards some end, the end being an aim, a goal, objective, whatever it might be. So in that sense, the tactics is a means towards some end. The means being action of some kind or other. On the other hand, you think of strategy, you think it's turning into the end too. Strategy being the design, the architecture, the scheme, the plan, etc. Also directed towards some end. Once again, aim, goal, objective, whatever it might be. Or another way to think. You think of the tactics as being a means for which to be against. You don't want to get any type of dispute clue. Because if you start closing too down too much those definitions, then you exclude possibility. That's one thing you don't want to do in conflict. You want to be able to entertain many possibilities. If you have more than your adversary, you can fling that out, and he doesn't know what to do. Panic, chaos, confusion, disorder, start coming to lose. So you don't want the definitive reality of solution. If the other guy understands what that is, he's going to be able to leverage you. And as you'll see, in that sense, variety is very important, particularly if you have a wider variety than your adversary in order to deal with. See, that's very important at times. And that's why you don't want to limit yourself to these definitions. Once again, the key idea here is to come up with sort of some general impression, general view of tactics and strategies, in other words, which you can subsume the other notions of. And then finally, the final bullet here, the idea we'll call a basis for grand strategy. Now, for the most part, these first three bullets here is what I call destructive behavior, pulling the guy apart so he can't go, trying to gain leverage over him. You're trying to put him in a confusion disorder, whatever it may be, so he can't go. You would like to think that should lead to some kind of constructive end or constructive behavior. And in this sense, I tend to use a grand strategy as a connecting link between my destructive behavior on one hand and my constructive behavior on the other. Doesn't mean you have to do it that way. It's sort of a fallout, just by the way, I want you to my investigation. And that'll become evident when we work our way through. And then finally, my intent, you know, why are we doing all this? Very simple. Or so you really understand the nature of conflict, survival, and conflict. Now, when I'm talking about survival and conquest, I'm not literally talking about you trying to take a club and beat your adversary over the head. I'm talking about it can be very soft, intermediate, or be very sharp. So it's not just physical, it's more on that one as well. You can cope with competitive pressure. You can deal with that environment. It's going to be okay, so that's sort of the character of the presentation. With that in mind, then let's go to our First point or outline, point of departure right here. As I've already indicated, I was very deeply involved in the evolution design of the F-15 lightweight fighter. There's also a already indication we had some problems there. And the key thing is, even though we have all this theory, eventually it's based up the real world of tests, we came up with certain anomalies. We'll explain those anomalies at some time. So I'm just going to give you some insight. One of the, what, what you'll think is a very trivial statement, but at the time was not what we were investigating. So out of that activity, we came up with this sort of a generalization in a related statement. The fact we needed to fight on a swinging term for a minute. They can both lose energy, gain energy more quickly while turning energy. So before we can deal with that statement, what do I mean by energy? Energy you think of in the sense that I'm using mechanically, the sum of your potential and your kinetic energy. Potential being altitude, kinetic being air. The point being, is if I'm going to maneuver someone and I'm going to gain energy, I either have to gain altitude, airspeed, or some combination thereof. If I'm going to lose energy, I'm going to have to lose altitude, airspeed, or some combination thereof. And the reason why we use energy is because it shows you the relationship between these two kinds of things, or two kinds of things which we describe as altitude and airspeed. That's why it's very convenient, very useful in that sense. You say, oh my God, that's sort of a terrible state. Well, a few years ago it was. Because the general perception then was you want to gain or conserve energy while trying to outturn that. That doesn't say conserve. You might want to pump 
found out an extraordinary amount of money making for a long time in order to gain a weapon. And I remember very vividly when I grilled some of the fighter pods and ran these tests, the lightweight fighters against other adversaries. This one pilot said, I really didn't want to lose that energy. I was trying to do something else, but I still want it. Right? Well, then it had value when you pumped it out. So even they were tending to fight. I said, you really want to reflect upon it when you lost it. Desirable result when you were to come out on top. And you gain. So it even took some time for people who were so called experts in fighter combat to gain a feel and acceptance of that idea very often. So that was one of the things that was So we found that out. And of course, that's the thing that you'll see that's led me into, drove me to the whole pattern of conflict we're getting to right now. In other words, the pilots also said other kinds of things. In other words, they, they, they really wanted was an airplane whereby they could dominate the circumstances of engagement. In other words, they could pick the engagement options when they go to red. Because they can tell a designer that he doesn't know something about it. So they think that's a big concern. But they go on. They become more specific. They say, in a sense, they want a fighter wherein they can either force an overshoot by an attacker or stay inside of our turning defense. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by overshoot. Let me use my hands to fight or if I'm going to make an attack upon somebody, the guy bends the airplane very hard, then I'm forced to overshoot a slight path that he can come in behind me and I'm in a bad position. Or contrary wise, if I'm on the defensive, what I want to do is force the guy to go overshoot my flight path so I can slide in behind him and take him out. That's what we call sort of a classic maneuver. All your things you're doing is to kind of get in that position. So on the offensive, you don't want to be forced to overshoot. On the defensive, you do it, you want to get that overshoot. So if you think about that, we see the spatial relationship. In some sense, in in a very general sense, you want to force your adversary in a wider maneuver space than you are, so you can get inside. In other words, you want to get inside his maneuver space so you can gain leverage on him. In this specific instance, we're going to generalize this term. Now, as it turns out, in order to make those hard maneuvers, that's not an easy thing to do. The maneuver may be easy, but then the drag goes up enormously above the thrust of the engine. When drag goes up above thrust, you have to lose altitude, airspeed, or some combination thereof. And you bend those airplanes so hard, build the drag up so high, you literally go down almost like a Otis elevator. You lose energy very quickly and spiral yourself right to the ground. Well, a pilot's not going to do that, for one thing. And the other thing is, remember, it's not just a duel one-on-one. -on -one. There's other people working in the weeds up there. And so when you're trying to work against somebody, somebody else will try to blindside you and take you out. So the point is, you don't want to engage too long in the You want to get in, do the job, get out, get in, do the job, get out. Because when you're working on somebody, somebody may be working on you. In other words, it's not healthy to get what we call tunnel vision and keep your eyes on one guy out there because somebody else is going to take you up. That's where the word comes from, tunnel vision. You've probably heard that term, fighter called Bell. Don't get tunnel vision. You've got to stay alert all the time. So you don't want to get wrapped up too long. You get your keep engagement short. Well, if you think about that, you're getting these very hard maneuvers that you're doing for very short intervals of time. Mm. So they're very jerky, they're very hoppy, they're very skippy. So you got a space problem, you got a time problem. Jerky maneuvers of time, space. We call that the transient. In other words, they're very fleeting. You know, notice underlying the term, fast transient, double underlying. Maneuver. In which we're trying to get inside our adversary's maneuver space, we're denying him that same opportunity against us, and we're going to do this over very short intervals of time so we don't get blindsided by somebody else. In other words, so in some sense, that gives a basis for controlling the engagement opportunity. We call it bang, bang. Now, if you think about that for when you say that's a very specific situation, that's just for air to air combat. But then the idea begins to occur to you and say, well, geez, very sharp turning or poppy skip and jumping kind of things like could be useful maybe in other kinds of competitive behavior where a guy can't get an image or a picture of what's going on. In other words, can we generalize or can we expand upon that idea? And if we do, where does that go? <laughs> that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So that time, but we'll stand upon an idea of fast trends. So we begin to think about instead of a very specific instance, we want to generalize. In some sense, what we're saying, and in some way, we want to operate at a faster tempo or rhythm than our adversary. 
they ended up. When I talk about them physically, you'll see later on morally, mentally, and physically. Right now, we'll show you sort of physical. Let's pin that down a bit. What we're really saying, if you're better yet, I'd say what I really want to do is get inside an adversary's observation, orientation, decision, action, time cycle, or loop. Or we'll show you later on time cycle for loops. Or loop. Say again? Right. Exactly right. We want to pin things down. We've got to get inside his mind. Look right inside. Right. But let's examine this. What are we really referring to? As individuals here, we have to observe what's going on out there. In other words, with our eyeballs, or get somebody else's observation, or we, in a warfare sense, modern electromechanical <coughs> equipment, or if an intelligence business, eavesdropping equipment, etc. You're gathering all that information from all the different sources. You literally then pump that information into your brain. What happens then when you pump that information into your brain? You start generating images, views, impressions, etc. What I call orientation. That orients you to what's going on. You start putting it all together. You get an orientation. Out of that orientation, possibilities begin to suggest themselves. And you have to pick, choose, or as I say, decide here upon the possibility. You can't do them all. You say, okay, I'm going to go for these or that. You make that decision. Then you have to implement that decision or take the action. Then you have to observe the consequences of that action, and you roll back to that loop again. Not only the consequences of that action, you're also doing what? You're drawing in peripheral information at the same time. And you roll through that loop. Well, guess what? All human beings, we all do. Our adversaries do, we do. But no, when I said, we want to get inside his loop. In other words, we want to be able to roll through that at a faster tempo or a faster pace than he can. And why do we want to do that? Why do say Because if we can do that, we will then begin to appear ambiguous or unpredictable to him. Not only that, we can generate confusion disorder in his system, our adversary system. Now let's get a deeper sense of that why. <coughs> because if you can do that, he will be unable to generate those appropriate images or pictures that agree with that unfolding phenomenon. Both menacing and fascist. No, I got them both under.